Touching Spirit Bear, Chapter 26. That evening, Cole fixed his favorite meal for everyone. As he chopped hot dogs into the spaghetti sauce, he told the group how Garvey had taught him that life was a hot dog. Tonight will be a feast because we make it a feast, he said. As he cooked, it began raining. Everybody retreated into the small cabin, sitting crowded on the bed, chairs, and stumps that Garvey carried in. When Cole finished preparing supper, he spread the atow on the small table. He explained the colorful blanket's special meaning. I only use this when the night is extra special, he said. Now let's eat. Everyone ate off paper plates held on their laps. Peter toyed with his fork. Honey, why aren't you eating, asked Peter's mother. Peter looked up and blurted, I'm not sleeping in here with him. It's okay, son, said Mr. Driscoll. Garvey will be here. He'll make sure that Cole won't. You don't have to sleep in this cabin with me if you don't want to, Cole interrupted. That's right, Edwin said. I brought along a tent. Cole can sleep outside until you change your mind. Peter eyed Cole with distrust, still refusing to eat. Half an hour later, he returned to the trawler with his parents to sleep. His food sat untouched. The next morning, Cole hiked alone to the pond. He soaked as long as he could, his calmness shaken by how terrified Peter was of him. How could he have once wanted someone to feel that way? No matter how deeply he breathed, soaking failed to take away his troubled thoughts. When he returned to camp, he found that Edwin had already brought Peter and his parents in from the trawler. They stood on the shore saying goodbye to Garvey. Cole overheard Peter arguing with his parents. But Dad, I don't want to, have to, I don't want to stay here alone with him, he pleaded. I've already explained you won't be alone. Garvey's here. You'll be okay. This is something you must do. When Peter turned and saw Cole approaching, he turned away. Cole went on to the cabin. Before leaving, Edwin visited Cole in the cabin. Mr. and Mrs. Driscoll decided to leave this morning, he said. They had planned to stay longer, but realized they can't protect Peter from himself. After yesterday, I think they saw that you are no longer the problem. He's so scared of me, Cole said. Edwin poured a last splash of coffee in his mug and took a sip. Be as patient with Peter as we've been with you, he said. Don't crowd him. Peter's father appeared in the doorway. Can I have a word with you alone, he said to Cole. Cole glanced at Edwin, then followed Mr. Driscoll outside. They walked together up into the trees where they were out of earshot of everyone else. <clears throat> Mr. Driscoll turned and spoke in a warning voice. You have changed some since we saw you back in Minneapolis. I'll allow you that much. But I also want to tell you, we haven't forgotten for a second what you did to our son. Not a day goes by that we don't think back to when you assaulted Peter. None of our lives will ever be the same again. Cole lowered his head. I don't like the idea of Peter being out here, being here one bit, Mr. Driscoll continued. We would never have forced him to come up here like this if we thought there was any other choice. After his second suicide attempt, Garvey convinced us that Peter needs to face you or be haunted by his memories for the rest of his life. Mr. Driscoll poked a stiff finger at Cole's chest. If you do anything to hurt our son now, God help me. You'll go to jail until you rot. Do you understand me? Cole nodded. Mr. Driscoll, this island can help Peter. I know you still don't trust me, but that's the truth. I've warned you, Mr. Driscoll said, as he turned and headed for the boat. Cole returned to the cabin. What did Mr. Driscoll have to say, Edwin asked. He just wished me a good day, said Cole, avoiding Edwin's eyes. Yeah, I'll bet he did. He has a right to be mad at me, said Cole. Edwin set his cup on the table and headed out the door. Stay up here in the cabin until we're gone, he said. I'm leaving the skiff with Garvey in case you have any problems. Cole watched through the window as everyone crawled into the skiff. Peter remained sitting on the shore. As Garvey motored out to the trawler, Peter glanced fearfully over his shoulder as if he thought someone might attack him. Even after Garvey returned to shore, Peter remained sitting by the water, staring at the trawler motor from the bay. Garvey returned to the cabin. Cole got up from his seat by the window and went to the cooler. There were only four candy bars left. He picked out a Snickers bar and started out the door. Where are you going, asked Garvey. I have to try something, Cole said. He walked slowly down across the rocks toward Peter. When he was 20 feet away, the sound of his footsteps made Peter look up. Stay away from me, Peter screamed, scrambling to get up. 
Cole backed away. Peter, I'm not going to hurt you. He held out the candy bar. I just brought you this. Get away, Peter screamed again. Cole crouched as he set the Snickers bar on a rock, then turned and retreated to the cabin. He sat down again by the window. Give him time, said Garvey. During the next half hour, Peter glanced at the candy bar several times, but didn't move toward it. Finally, Cole pulled out his schoolwork and began working on his math. After a full hour, he rocked back in his chair and rubbed at his eyes. How are my parents, he asked. Garvey set down a book he was reading and looked up. Your mother is doing great and sends her love. Your father has filed a lawsuit to have the abuse charges against him dropped. He's also filed for your custody. You mean he wants to take me away from my mom? I think it's a matter of pride. He thinks he can always get his way and doesn't want anyone or anything to win out over him. Cole traced the eraser of his pencil across the table. I used to be like that. I know you did. Do you think he'll win, asked Cole? Garvey shook his head over my dead body. Cole set down his pencil. I haven't talked to you in a long time, he said. Thanks for standing by me and for everything else you've done. How can I ever pay you back? Garvey pointed toward the shore. Pay me back by not giving up on Peter. Cole looked out the window and saw that Peter was still sitting on the shore, but the Snickers bar was gone. Cole smiled. I won't give up on him. When another two hours passed without Peter moving, Garvey went out to talk to him. Even after coaxing, Peter refused to enter the cabin until Cole had left and set up a tent nearly a hundred yards away. All afternoon, Cole sat in the tent. After dark, Garvey brought out some hot supper. How long do I stay out here, Cole asked, shivering as he wolfed down the warm food. How long does somebody stay scared when they've been beaten senseless, Garvey asked bluntly. Good night. Cole watched Garvey return to the warm cabin. Garvey and Peter were sleeping warm and comfortable in a cabin he had made with his own two hands. Here he was, sleeping in a leaky tent in the drizzle and wind. Instead of starting a fire in the pit, Cole crawled into his sleeping bag and went to sleep early. When he rose the next morning, he forced himself to crawl from the warm sleeping bag and pull on his stiff, cold clothes. Before heading to the pond, he knocked on the cabin door and called softly. I'm going to the pond. Anybody going with me? What time is it, Garvey asked, his voice hoarse. Cole realized he hadn't looked at a clock in nearly a year. It's time to go soak in the pond. That's what time it is, he said. Give us five minutes, Garvey said. I don't want to go soak in any pond, Peter mumbled. We'll just go along and watch, Garvey said. Cole saw a lantern flicker in the window, and he heard movement inside. Soon, Garvey and Peter emerged from the cabin, both wearing their rubber boots and heavy jackets. Immediately, Cole set out through the dark, heavy mist, walking slowly so Peter could keep up. He heard the distinct shuffle of Peter's awkward footsteps behind him. When they reached the pond, Cole realized that he had forgotten to bring a towel. It didn't matter. He could use his undershirt. He stripped and entered the frigid water. Peter and Garvey sat down on the bank to watch. It was nearly the beginning of May, but still the icy water pierced Cole's skin like millions of tiny needles. He waded in, forcing steady breaths until he reached the rocky rock ledge on the far side. Eyes closed, he heard Garvey's muffled voice speaking to Peter on the other side of the pond, but he couldn't make out what was said. Cole soaked until his breath felt chilled, then he waded back to shore. His body had numbed to the bone, but he didn't rush. During the last year, he had grown accustomed to the icy water. No longer did it take his breath away as it had when he first came here with Edwin. Do you guys want to carry the ancestor rock with me, he asked, as he wiped dry with his undershirt. I've explained the ancestor rock to Peter, Garvey said. We'll hike along and watch you. Cole picked up the large rock and started up the slope. He led the way, never past pausing or looking back. By the time he reached the top, his bad arm ached, but he still breathed normally. Peter and Garvey both breathed hard, and heavy sweat beaded on their foreheads. Now my ancestor rock becomes my anger, Cole explained, setting the big rock down. He turned to Peter. You can push it down the hill if you want. Peter shook his head. I'll do it then, Cole said, giving the rock a hard shove. As the rock tumbled down the hill, Cole closed his eyes. When I hear that sound, I imagine my anger leaving, he explained. He waited until the crashing rock came to a stop at the bottom, remained motionless for a moment longer, 
then opened his eyes and started down the slope. Nobody spoke as they worked their way back downstream. Do you need help with anything, Garvey asked as they arrived back in camp. I need to collect more firewood if I'm going to be staying outside much longer. Do you feel like helping us collect firewood, Garvey asked Peter. Peter turned and walked to the shore and stared off at the horizon without answering. What's his problem, Cole said. You, Garvey replied. But I hope he knows we're collecting this firewood because of him, Cole whispered. Garvey answered quickly. I hope you know that everybody's up here because of you. Cole began collecting wood. Day after day went by with no change in Peter. He refused to speak, doing whatever Garvey asked of him, but no more. He hiked along each morning to the pond, but never soaked. When he ate or walked, he moved zombie-like in slow motion. Cole quit trying to make conversation with him. Nearly two full weeks after Peter's arrival, they all hiked up the hill one morning with Cole carrying the ancestor rock. When he set the rock down at the top, he paused a moment to rest. Without warning, Peter reached down and gave the rock a hard shove. He stood with his lips bunched, watching until the rock crashed to a stop at the bottom. That was a good push, Cole told him. The rest of the day, Peter remained withdrawn as usual, avoiding Cole. Three days later, while Cole was cooking lunch in the fire pit, a rock struck the ground only feet away. Cole turned to find Peter beside the shore, pitching stones into the water as if nothing had happened. Cole looked at the stone that had almost hit him and realized his hands were clenched into fists. He never told Garvey about the stone, but he kept a close eye on Peter. The next incident occurred with Garvey along two days later as they were hiking to the pond. It was early in the morning, and Cole had just jumped from one rock to another in the stream. All of a sudden, Peter bumped him hard from behind and sent him sprawling into the water. Soaking wet, Cole picked himself up. He found Peter watching him with a smirk. Why did you do that, Cole asked. I didn't mean to bump you, Peter said innocently. Garvey said nothing as Cole continued to the pond. I'm skipping my soak this morning, Cole said, because I don't have any dry clothes to change into, but I'll still carry my ancestor rock. As he turned to pick up the rock, he discovered Peter stripping off his clothes. The thin boy ran stumbling into the shallow water, holding his arms above his head. He waded forward, gasping and grunting loudly. Peter never made it across to the rocks. When the water reached his chest, he turned and waded back out. His teeth chattered as he dried himself with his undershirt. That morning, after they returned to camp, Peter seemed more relaxed. He spoke to Cole without being, spoke, without being spoken to first. Don't you get frozen when you soak in the pond, he asked. Cole smiled. The first time I soaked last year, I thought my head would crack open and my toes would fall off. But you get used to it. I don't want to get used to it, Peter muttered. His head, he headed toward the cabin without looking back. As the days passed, the air grew warmer, but the rain came daily. Every morning, Cole hung his sleeping bag up in the cabin to dry off. I'm going to give Edwin a leaky tent for Christmas, he complained to Garvey. Peter returned to being sullen, refusing to talk. Garvey went about each day, joking with boys as usual. He kept delivering warm meals to Cole in the tent. Nearly a month had passed since Peter arrived on the island. Twice, Edwin had stopped by to drop off supplies and to check up on them. He never stayed for long. One day, a hard rain fell and Cole stayed inside the tent. Hour after hour, the steady downpour soaked through the seams, soaking Cole's sleeping bag and clothes. Mid-afternoon, Garvey brought out food. He stared at Cole, huddled with his arms wrapped around his knees. Dang, it's cold out here, champ, he said. I'm going back inside. Thanks, Cole muttered. For several more hours, he sat and shivered. Outside, the rain kept falling and lightning brought angry thunder to the sky. As night fell, a small stream of water trickled across the center of the floor. Everything Cole touched was wet, soggy, and cold. He prepared himself for a long night. Tonight, he wouldn't sleep much. He hugged his arms to his chest and let his teeth chatter. He hadn't been this cold since he had nearly drowned, trying to escape more than a year ago. Suddenly, he heard footsteps outside the tent. It's warmer in the cabin if you want, called Peter's hesitant voice.